planet Earth is being visited by extraterrestrial travelers from a group of suns called the Pleiades, and it's time you knew about it. Hello, I'm Jay Randolph Winters, and the past seven, eight years I've been disseminating information about the most well-documented UFO case ever on record. I'm talking about the case of Mr. Edward Albert Meyer. You see, in 1975, Mr. Meyer began having contacts with extraterrestrial travelers from the star system we call the Pleiades. Now, these contacts are still continuing today. And we've always wondered, are extraterrestrial travelers coming here? And if they did, would they land on the White House lawn? Would they visit you and I? How would it happen? Or has it already happened? Well, it has. And they've been visiting Mr. Meyer for many years. What we're going to talk about today is his conversations with those travelers. You see, he's been allowed to go on board ship with them, travel to other galaxies. He's taken over a thousand beautiful, clear pictures. There have been metal samples, landing tracks, biological samples, and a lot of other evidences. But probably most important to you and I are the conversations. You see, he's been able to talk to them now for years and ask them questions about us. Where are we from? Where are we going? Who are we? Man's always been puzzled by his past. We seem to have been left alone here a little bit on Earth with no great contact with our past. So today we're going to discuss that, and I'm going to get you a little bit more familiar with our connection with the Pleiadians. For a long time, we've had an urge to contact someone who sincerely wants to be helpful in our mission. Here and there, we open such contacts with inhabitants of different worlds, but only when they have developed enough to become rational, thinking beings. Then we prepare them for the thought that they are not the only rational thinking beings in the universe. If extraterrestrials are going to visit us, who are they going to pick to talk to? Now, we hear the expression a lot about landing on the White House lawn, but is that really a good idea? Are we all ready for that? Is the world ready to suddenly be confronted with irrefutable proof that there are extraterrestrials out there? Or would they perhaps just choose one or two of us or a small group of us to pass on their message? Well, it seems in this particular instance they've chosen just one man. Billy's contacts with the Pleiadians begin when he was only five. They were telepathic at first, but later on at the age of seven, he made his decision to go on with the mission. Eleven years of telepathic transmissions from a Pleiadian man named Spath. At the age of 16, however, his teaching was taken over by an extraterrestrial named Ascot. These pictures, taken in India, are of Ascot, her crew, and her ships. As Billy started studying about man and raising his consciousness to a point that he would be able to have his mission scheduled for later on in life. And then it began, January 1975, Hinwell, Switzerland. At approximately 6 a.m. in the morning, Edward Albert Meyer, better known as Billy, woke up on his farm to get to work as usual. Unbeknown to him, though, in the Pleiades, the system of Tegeta, on a small planet called Ira, a lady named Simyasi was preparing to begin her seven-hour trip to the planet Earth. She'd been preparing for ten years, studying Billy's mind, his emotions, and working with other people in the Pleiadian race about what to tell us, what to teach us, how to gently awaken us to the fact that we are not alone. As her ship came into our solar system that day, she sent a telepathic message to Billy. Billy received this. He felt a familiar cooling spot on his forehead, paid attention to the message, hopped on his moped, took his camera with him, and rode out to a secluded area in the forest that he was being led to. Now on that day, this may be similar to what Simyasi saw as she approached Earth to begin a long-awaited and anticipated meeting with Billy Meyer. She'd even learned his language to have these meetings. Billy was waiting patiently, waiting by the trees, watching for something to appear. And then it happened. A silver ship came in very quietly. At first, he wasn't sure if the ship would stay, it would land, or what was going to happen. So he snapped a couple of pictures just in case it darted away. He was a little surprised, you see, because he wasn't expecting these contacts to happen for another year. Well, the ship moved to the left, went around behind the trees, and appeared again, so he snapped a couple of more pictures. By the way, all the pictures that Billy has taken are with an Olympus 35mm camera that has a little wheel on the back to advance the film. You see, Billy only has one arm. His left arm, unfortunately, was severed in a bus accident years earlier. 
Billy wasn't anxious or scared. As a matter of fact, he knew the Pleiadians were human just like us. He already knew that their forefathers were our forefathers, and he was expecting to have meaningful conversations with these people because they did bring peace and love to us. Billy walked towards the ship as it gently set down on the meadow, but he was arrested, he said, by unseen force. He couldn't seem to get any closer, so he just waited. And then a lady from the stars stepped out. As Billy sat under the tree that day, talking with Semyasi very casually, he couldn't help but notice just a hundred meters away the gleaming starship that she had just arrived in. He had to ask, how does that thing work and how long did it take you to get here? Well, Semyasi replied, we call them beam ships. And that name comes from a long time ago in their history when the first propulsion system that they came upon to move among the stars was a light emitting device. And the name beam ship stuck because it worked on a principle of light transmission. They no longer use that, she says, but the name is always stuck. They prefer the round shape. It's comfortable for one thing. The old drive systems needed that shape, so they had a different body surface to facilitate the magnetic drive. They no longer do, by the way. But she told him it just took seven hours to get here, but she thought that was a long time to have to travel in a ship. That might not seem too long to us. She had left ERA and flown here and got here that quickly. How can that be? Now, that's 500 light years away. Now, by our technology, that would be impossible at this moment. Our best rockets are moving 30, 40,000 miles per hour. The speed of light is dramatically faster than that, closer to 700 million miles per hour. So how is it possible? You see, what they've done, she explained, is the ships speed up to approximately the speed of light. At that point, the mass-speed correlation, in other words, the energy of the universe pressing in on the ship, is tremendous. The ships are protected by an energy screen that holds that off. Just at the right moment, they lower those screens and all that energy is forced in against the ship. Well, they use that energy in kind of a compression fashion to do something really unique. They convert the ship and all matter involved with it into thought. They call it spiritual energy. We would just think of it as thought. It no longer exists in the material frame. What that allows them to do is step outside of time into null time and then move that thought at a much higher speed to its destination. Then the ship and everything that's in it rematerializes again in its material form, allowing them to traverse these vast distances literally at the speed of a thought. You see, it took three and a half hours when she left ERA to speed up to the speed they were going to make this conversion. Then the jump just took a part second. There's not even any realization of it. Then it took about three and a half hours to slow down again to get into our solar system. Why the three and a half hours? Semyasi explained that they learned a long time ago that they need to be 153 million kilometers away from the nearest orbiting body before they make this conversion from time to null time. She says that what happens is when that conversion is made, there's kind of a rip or a tear, so to speak, in time. And any orbiting planet that may be too close to that may get pulled out of its orbit or become unstable. So they've learned to be very cautious. They always make these time jumps outside of solar systems. So when they approached our solar system, they were 153 million kilometers plus outside of our solar system when they rematerialized in the material. It then took three and a half hours for them to cruise in through our solar system, through all of the outside planets, to get to Earth. And that's how she arrived here that day. Life on a Pleiadian world is very similar to life on an Earth world. They grow up, have children, get married, just the same as we do. But there are some differences. Their skin is a little lighter. It's not as dense as ours. There are some differences in their fingers. Some of them don't have the first knuckle. They live to be 700 to 1,000 years old. They spend their first 70 years in educational process, learning many different types of professions. They're not superhuman. They're just like us. They have to constantly evolve. They have to constantly learn. The Pleiadians also explain that there's over a million eight hundred thousand other planets of human life that they've discovered so far. Billy lives on this farm in Schmidrudy, Switzerland. It's about an hour outside of Zurich. He's lived there through the duration of over 135 contacts that are still going on now. At almost every contact, he'd feel that cooling sensation and be led out to some remote area in the forest, and the ships would come and get him. 
Over the years, Billy has amassed piles and piles of notes on information on all sorts of subjects, from history to creation to spiritual information. He still lives there operating the Semyasi Silver Star Center in Switzerland, writing his books and continuing with his contacts at this time. In 1976, we took this picture of Edward Albert Meyer as he sat in front of his house as the contacts were still happening. The Pleiadians tell us that in their history, they can go back 22 million years to a time in ancient Lyra. Their ancestors were having massive wars, and at that time they fled and they went to Earth. Their records show that's the first colonization of the Lyrians of the planet Earth at that time. The Pleiadians themselves didn't come here until about 230,000 years ago. We have been told by them that they feel that almost a third of us have the Lyrian genetic seed within us. The Lyrians coming from much larger planets were 25 to 30 feet tall, which in the past has led to many of our old stories of Titans and Goliaths. This is the Lyrian Eye of God floating in space now. There used to be a sun in the middle, but the Lyrians destroyed that along with many other planets and millions of people in their violent wars of the past. The Pleiadians themselves had to flee ancient Lyra also. Over 230,000 years ago they left and found themselves a new home. They drifted for four years until they found a system of 254 blue suns to begin a new life in. Well, just as Semyasi said, the contacts kept on going on. About every two weeks, the ship would show up. Billy would feel that familiar cooling sensation on his forehead. He would be led out to a remote area somewhere around where he lived, and the ship would come and pick him up. Pick him up? Hmm. How do you get into an extraterrestrial craft? Well, they beam him up, very similar to what we're used to seeing on Star Trek. Billy says it's fairly similar, but there is a catch to it. You see, the Pleiadian ships are designed to beam up Pleiadian people, for the most part, and it's based somewhat on their level of emotions, and their emotions are a little different than ours. You see, they're a little finer. They don't have many of the emotions that you and I are still working out, hate, anger, and some of the other frustrating things. Those lower, baser energies can get in the way. Billy says if he has any anger, fear, jealousy, or he's just worried about things, that once this beam takes him apart molecularly and brings him up into the ship, he may not come back together exactly the way that he started. So the Pleiadians early on in the contacts had a habit usually of picking Billy up when he didn't even know about it, when he was clear of mind. Think about that. Billy may have been standing around the farm sawing a log or working with something and suddenly find himself just standing inside of the beam ship holding his saw. Quite often they would also pick him up out of his office, where he may be clear of thought or just concentrating on them. Good way to fly, right? There's another way to get up into the ship. You can be lifted up also by virtue of what we might think of as anti-gravity. It just lifts you up. They look at it more as a way of lifting up cargo and things and don't usually use it for people. Billy's tried that. He says usually the ship might be up 300, 400 meters or so, and this lifting sensation just starts pulling you up into the ship. Now, when that happens, it may take four, five, six seconds for you to get all the way up into the ship. You can see everything around you as you go flying by the trees and find yourself zooming away from the ground. Now, there's a problem, he says, that if you fall off or you get upset and uh, feel like you're going to fall over, and you do, there's no way to catch you. It's particularly spooky on your way down. So Billy says if you're going to have contacts with the Pleiadians and you have a choice, request beaming. You have whole organizations which investigate our beam ships, but they have little material that is really authentic. However, the authorities already know much about our existence, but they continue to deny the fact of our existence, or even the fact of their research. They want only to rule the cosmos, but are not able to create on Earth peace among themselves. The Pleiadians have now lived for 50,000 years peacefully, that's because they say their government is a lot different than ours. They now let those with the most wisdom rule. Here in Andromeda live a race of people who no longer live in the material body, a race that has evolved to a point of light. The Pleiadians take suggestions from these people and live by that wisdom. Also, among the other questions that did come up, Billy had to ask, would they interfere in the event we had a nuclear war. And where do they draw the line? What is their sense of morality? 
The Pleiadians explained that they belonged to a federation, you might call it, a group or an alliance of other races just like themselves that advanced to about the same level. And they'd all come together and decided, you might say, the rules governing planets like ourselves. The rules go something like this. As long as we are confined to our own solar system, not able to leave it, not able to affect those other races out there, then we're pretty much on our own down here, being left alone to do what we want. Once we can leave our own solar system, though, and come out there, then we have to start bending to someone else's rules. There are already races out there that already have rules trying to keep the peace. They're a little worried about us leaving the planet the way we are, with so many nations arguing and bickering. This is something we have to work on. They don't interfere, they say, in our political or our power structure as long as we are confined to our own solar system. But the time is rapidly approaching when technically we're going to be able to leave and then we're going to have to face up to that. They're concerned about whether or not we will align ourselves with them and with other peaceful races or will we very stubbornly go ahead our own way. This is something that we have to decide. And neither is it consistent with the truth that our brothers and sisters come from other parts of space on behalf of a god to bring to the world the long-awaited peace. In no case do we come on behalf of anybody, since creation by itself confers no obligation on us. It is a law unto itself, and every form of life must conform with it and become a part of it. The Pleiadians have several different sizes of ships serving different needs. The one you're looking at, they think of as a time travel ship. It's a little larger than the regular beam ship. It's about 28 feet in diameter. It has that unusual ability to travel in time. Billy was able to travel to the 13th century and many other time zones. On a couple of occasions, though, he took some remarkably clear pictures of this ship. And when investigators were investigating his case to try to determine the validity of it, it was this series of pictures that was used and tested by the computer. This picture, called the Sunshot, was important because it clearly shows the ship behind the tree, thus ruling out the possibility of small models. Pictures were taken to several different places and analyzed by a computer. They were looking for strings or any other devices that Billy may have used to actually fake the pictures. Actually, models were even made at one particular time to compare with the real pictures to see if the computer could catch them. The computer caught them each time. This is a digitized picture or a blow-up of some of those pictures that were used by the computer. No evidence of a hoax has ever been discovered in Billy's pictures. Landing tracks were also investigated. Gamma radiation readings were found. Here's a picture of Billy standing by one of the landing tracks. The most unusual thing about the landing tracks is you can see here that even months later, the grass was still growing the opposite direction. The ship apparently had overcome Earth's gravity and caused the grass to grow the wrong direction. Billy says insects by the thousands were attracted to it for a long period of time. The grass was never broken, it just grew the wrong way. On several occasions, Billy was allowed to actually make sound recordings of the beam ships as they flew overhead. Normally, the ships flew very quietly, but when the screens were turned off, allowing the sound to come out, Billy made the recording that you're listening to now. The sound recordings have been analyzed by sound engineers who state that at this time with our present technology, they don't know of any way that we could duplicate this sound. This next series of pictures is very unique because the tree you're looking at no longer exists in this location. You see, after Billy took these pictures, he took some friends out with him to show them where the contact had happened. The tree was not there. He later asked Simyasi what happened. She explained that the ship somehow had leaked some radiation that had damaged the tree. They were very concerned about the welfare of the tree, so they decided to do something about it. What they did was... They changed the tree's time so it did not exist in a time where it could get hurt. What they've actually done is gone back to the point when the tree was seeded. They then moved the seed so the tree grew up someplace else. Now, the most unique thing here is that 
No one else in the neighborhood has any reminiscence of that tree ever growing there now. Billy has pictures of a tree existing, but they don't believe him. You can go to the farmer who lives on this property now and ask him about the tree that was supposed to be there. He thinks Billy's totally crazy because the tree is not there. He has no memory of it ever growing there, but the picture exists. This picture even shows the ship going around behind the tree. This concept of time may seem fantastic to us. Could it be part of a larger knowledge that the Pleiadians are gently awakening us to? Above everything stands one force alone. We call it the creation. It regulates the laws over all, the life and death of everything in the universe, because it is everything in the universe. Among the many things discussed with the Pleiadians was life. And I don't mean just human life. You see, to the Pleiadians, everything is alive, not just human life. There is animal life. There is plant life. Even the planet Earth is alive. All of these things are created out of the same creational energy. They are just manifested at what we call different levels of density, and they evolve in different ways. You and I evolve by having material lifetimes. We do what is called dying, and then we come back, hopefully, a little more evolved than we were the last time. Did you know that planets also evolve? Now, planets don't die like you and I do, but they have what are called ice ages. The planet Earth is on a 700,000-year cycle of its evolvement. It's been through several of them already. Originally, an ice age will cover the entire planet. As the planet gets older and older, there's less need for it. It has to make way for things that are more evolved than it is. So ice ages cover a smaller area of the planet. But the planet is evolving. Now, what does that mean? That means every time there's an ice age, when the ice age is over, rocks will evolve to something just a little bit higher in evolution. A small plant may be an even more beautiful flower. A tree will even be larger and more beautiful than it was. A fish may evolve up into a larger type of fish. Even the squirrels, the chipmunks, all the little creatures, everybody evolves, including you and I. Now, we're not real cognizant of that on this planet. And perhaps, maybe, we're being just a little irresponsible in the way we share our planet with all the other life that's on it, including the planet. The pictures I'm going to show you now are satellite pictures that appeared in Discover Magazine not too long ago. It can give us a, a good look at the ozone problem. We're all becoming familiar with that, the lack of ozone and the change in it, and how it's going to affect us. Let's have a look at these pictures. The satellite picture of the southern pole of Earth shows the condition of the ozone as in 1980. In 1975, the Pleiadians warned Billy that we were seriously damaging the ozone. We had started that over 60 years ago. They urged Billy to send letters to scientists around the world, which he did. He got no reply. In 1986, this satellite picture shows the ozone hole now 3,000 miles in diameter, covering over 1.2 million square miles. This allows ultraviolet radiation to come into our atmosphere at a deadly rate, killing the photosynthesis process. At the moment, we have no known technology to repair this. It could take thousands of years for nature to do it on its own. The Pleiadians want us to know we have a very unique planet, an abundance of life. We benefit from having so many extraterrestrial ancestors in the past. 22 million years ago, the ancient Lyrians came here, and when they did, they brought with them some of their culture and, of course, some of their plant and animal life. In the last 389,000 years, we've been visited by many different civilizations throughout our galaxy. Some of them have stayed for a short period of time. Others have lived here for a while. They've brought with them wonders from their world, and they've taken back many wonderful things from ours. You see, the important thing is for us to understand that we're not only not living alone in the universe, but we're sharing a planet with a lot of other wonderful life forms. You are a spiritual being going through a series of material lives on purpose to gather information to feed your spirit and grow. And you're sharing this world with a lot of other life forms doing the same thing in their own way. See, animals evolve, plants evolve, and of course the planet itself evolves. We have to live in harmony with all of these different life forms. In our galaxy alone, there are over 44 million planets that naturally evolve the human form on its own. In the trillions of years of its life, at the moment there are 7.5 billion planets that have human life and over 340 different shapes of the human form. 
different sizes, shapes, and colors, and so forth. But what about the Pleiadian planets? The Pleiadians are descendants of the Lyrians, and they tell us about a third of us have their genetics in them. Well, Semyasi says that on their planets, by the way, they live in a solar system, and their sun is called Teget. There's ten planets in their system. They live on four of them. Their main planet is called Era. It's just 10% smaller than Earth. The atmosphere is very similar. And matter of fact, they find Switzerland very comfortable. It's very similar to their home world. You see, there is a large family of man out there, and it's time for us to become aware we're about to join them. Among the more interesting things that Billy's been allowed to do with the Pleiadians was riding those ships. Now, on many occasions, they'd pick him up, and they would go to different places to teach him things. You see, it's one thing for you and I to discuss these things, and it affects our belief system and our logic, and we scratch our head and say, well, maybe, that might be. We work it into our thoughts. For Billy, it was a little bit different. They wanted him to experience things for himself so he would know his own truths. One of the most amazing concepts that extraterrestrials are going to introduce to us that we have to keep track of and learn about is time. We've suggested that a little bit, but I'd like to tell you a little bit of story about time so you can kind of get your own frame of reference a little bit better. On one occasion, Billy was asking about time, and he was having difficulty understanding it himself. And they said, well, come along in the ship, and we'll show you how it works. They got into the ship, one of the ships that's capable of moving in time. They pulled off the planet. Billy doesn't know how far. He says he just looked on the screens inside of the ship and it looked like they were you know, quite a ways away from Earth. He could see it looking pretty small. Then they went right back down to Earth. He doesn't know how really how that works. As they got back down to Earth, they said, well, we're in a different time. Now, nothing had happened. Billy hadn't felt anything, so how do you know you're in a different time? Billy stepped outside of the ship and suddenly knew that something was different. The look and feel of the surroundings set off his senses. Billy found himself in the 16th century where nature had a fresh feeling like it had just been made. The air smelled differently, the sky was more blue, the grass, the trees, everything had a different feel to them. They hadn't been tainted yet by the Industrial Revolution. Well, while Billy was here, he was still having trouble understanding, how does time work? Can you go back in time and affect the past? And will it affect your future, the present? What happens? Well, Billy had taken with him a battery lantern and he couldn't resist the possibility to try this out. Now, we're several hundred years back in time. While they were there, they visited a Frenchman, and he left behind with him this battery lantern. And he told the man, he says, take this lantern and use it. Make more batteries and put lights around your house and wire it to your door. He told him how to do it. He says, I want to go back in my own time now, which was 1956 then. He was 19 when this happened. He wanted to go back in his own time and see if he could find some record in history then of this man having done something in the past that would affect the future. So Billy leaves the battery-powered lantern in the 16th century. He gets back in the ship and goes home. Now, he can't wait till he finds out. In an old book on French history provided by a friend, Billy finds his answer. In these old books, it talks about the man who lived who had a strange house that people would go to and see strange lights. They would grab his doorknob and some strange force would bite them or hurt them. It did turn up. Billy was able to go to the past, leave something in the past, and affect now and affect the future. In effect, time rewrote itself. A difficult concept, right? But time is something you and I are going to have to learn to live with in a little bit different way in the future. It's very unusual to get pictures of extraterrestrial spacecraft. It's even more unusual to get more than one craft at a time. Billy has pictures of two, three, even four craft. What you're looking at here is a small remote ship hovering below a regular beam ship. These remote or telemeter ships, as the Pleiadians call them, are used to keep track of our languages. You see, they monitor all of our languages. They say they have on file every language we've ever spoken on this planet. The reason for that is simple. The Pleiadians, even though they're telepathic, have difficulty listening to some of our emotions. It makes them feel uncomfortable physically. So they use the remote or telemeter ships to monitor our languages, our news broadcasts. This allows the Pleiadians to study us to better understand the differences in our societies. 
On many occasions, Billy was asked if he could bring friends along to see the ships. They always remarked, no, that would not be possible. However, they did allow on a few occasions for Billy to bring several friends together and take pictures at night. Billy, however, was the only one ever allowed aboard ship. Usually people would drive him out to a contact, let him out, and Billy would disappear into the woods. Quite often, Billy could be taking pictures of the ships, and someone standing even 100 yards down the road couldn't see them. Billy quite often asked if it would be possible to visit other worlds, and are there other civilizations out there having the same problems that we are, and how are they doing at it? Well, Simyasi came one day and says, I've gotten permission to take you with me, and we're going to visit other galaxies. You're going to get to go aboard our very large mothership, if you want to call it that. And not only are you going to get to meet the leader of that, but we're going to take you to some other places. We want you to know, we want you to have your own truth about what's going on out there in that family of man that's spread all throughout the universe. This picture was taken from out the window of a beam ship by Billy. You can see the ship just in front of them in the bottom frame of the picture. The green color is caused by the atmosphere inside of the ship. Well, Billy was picked up, and he was taken on the ship with him. They went up to the large mother ship that was in orbit somewhere around Jupiter at that time. While he was there, he got to meet Pata, as pronounced Pata. And he is the leader, or one of the leaders, of the Pleiadian race. They have several. By the way, their leaders are a little different than ours. They're called Ishwish, which means in the Pleiadian language, King of Wisdom. Pata is an Ishwish. This is a picture of Ascot, his teacher of earlier years. He was reunited with her again on the mothership that day. One of the rare pictures of the extraterrestrials. On this particular ride on the mothership, by the way, there was 140,000 people on the mothership living there. The ship was about 17 miles high and about 10 miles in diameter. Looked a little bit like five golf balls all hooked together. Well, the ship left our area of the galaxy and went to someplace else. They had something to show Billy. Billy and Simyasi got into one of the smaller ships, left the mother ship, and went off on their own. Because Simyasi wanted him to see what World War III looked like on another planet. When they got close to the planet, Billy was looking at the screens inside of the ship, and Simyasi was explaining to him that this planet down here is having problems similar to what's going on on your own planet. One government against another, one nation, one brother against another. But it had gone a little farther on this planet. They were into their World War III. They were hurling giant missiles already at each other. Billy watched in terror almost on the screens as he saw people by the millions being killed. It was right in the middle of battle. He couldn't help asking Simyasi, why don't you interfere? Why don't you get involved? She said, this isn't our section of space, and there is another race of people, which she showed him on another screen, that lives in this area that will be involved soon. They said it's important for us to know that they feel we have our own right to grow on our own, that they're not going to interfere in our right to do whatever we want to with ourselves. They would defend the planet. They wouldn't let us blow the planet up. But we have our own free will to do with our lives as we want. However, on this world, it was coming close to seriously damaging it, and this race of people had decided that they were going to interfere. As Billy watched, Semyasi told him that the battle would end soon, that not any more would die, that within a few days they would come to their senses, the extraterrestrials who were in that area would make their presence be felt, and peace would come on that planet. But it would be peace on their own terms. It would be peace because they wanted peace. They would not be forced to by any extraterrestrials. As they watched on the screens, Billy noticed a runaway missile that had gotten off track, and it streamed right by the little ship they were in. And actually, it even rocked their ship a little bit. And Simyasi had to grab the controls and get the ship back in control. It had bumped into the screens protecting the ship. As the very large missile hurled its way on out into space, Billy had to ask, are you going to allow that to happen? What's going to happen with that giant missile with that large warhead on it? She said, well, watch. Even as we speak now, Pata's ship is doing something about it. What he watched, he said, or what he saw was a little strange. They have a way of dealing with things like that that's a little beyond our science. Billy looked out the window, and he saw the giant missile hurling on into space. And as it passed in front of Pata's much larger ship, a very strange kind of liquid-looking energy came out of Pata's ship and engulfed the giant missile as it went by. Suddenly, the whole form of it went into a rectangular shape. It engulfed the missile. 
and it kind of froze in space there just for a second. And Billy said it's kind of hard to describe, that suddenly it just kind of crackled like an egg cracking and disappeared. Whatever energy they had put out engulfed the missile, broke it down into its own molecular structure, whatever, and it just disappeared, a fine way of dealing with it. Either that or it somehow exploded into itself. We don't really know. That technology is a little beyond us. So extraterrestrials do interfere at some point. Just like the Pleiadians have told us, they would draw the line when we start to affect the planet, the solar system, or the universe around us. But we have the right of free will to do with ourselves as we please. Billy and his family were awakened one night by this strange energy, strange light, whatever you want to call it. Billy went outside and took some pictures of it as it hovered over the parking lot in front of his house. It also awoke people all over the area. Billy only was able to run off four or five shots that night. He tried mentally to communicate with it, but received nothing. Later, when he asked Semyasi what it was, she didn't know either. We could be looking at the first ever pictures of a collective consciousness, a group of people living in energy form. Man should know that the God Force is quite simply that of creation, and that man also, either coming from the higher spiritual spheres or being elevated to those spheres after numerous terrestrial lives, is subject to creation and respectively complementary to it. The higher he soars, the greater becomes his power. However, one can never identify God separately from the creation, because God itself is a part of creation. If you had your own extraterrestrial to talk to, I'm sure you'd make a great list of questions to ask. High on my list, of course, would be, tell me a little bit about what you think of God. Do you have God on your planet, and do you have religion? What do you think of ours? You see, we've been confined to our planet all along here for several thousand years without influence from other races, as far as we know. And we've been left alone to kind of come up with our own forms of religion and belief structures. Of course, on this planet, you can travel to about any country and get a different idea of what religion or belief should really be. But what do the Pleiadians think, and what are their concepts? To begin with, what we call a universe, they call a creation. Now, their science is far more advanced than ours, obviously. So they've learned a lot of things that, about the universe, how it's come together and so forth, that we need to know. It ties right in with a discovery of who we are and what's really going on. The Pleiadians have what they call the laws of creation, the discovery of how life started and what a creation is. These are valuable things for us, and it's going to make a major change on our planet as these sort of new principles work their way into our society. How will we adjust to that? How will the church and other people adjust to information that comes from these type of sources when they tell us what they saw when uh, Jesus Christ was crucified, when the pyramids were built, when Moses parted the Red Sea? Or did these things really happen the way that we've heard about them? Well, let's talk a little bit about the laws of creation. What are laws of creation? It's the rules that the Pleiadians have figured out that they live by to govern their lives, how the universe came about and how they came about. It basically goes back a little bit almost to what we've learned about Eastern philosophy a little bit. You see, they not only believe in reincarnation, they use reincarnation. It, it's a study with them. They're, they're born already aware of other lives. They're born into a telepathic society where they communicate with each other. They understand each other's feelings. Can you imagine what it'd be like on our world if suddenly all of us had mental telepathy and we could hear each other's thoughts? For the most part, we all walk around pretty comfortable that other people don't know our thoughts. If I suddenly told you that by <coughs> watching this tape in 10 minutes, you would suddenly all become telepathic and know each other's thoughts, there'd probably be a big scramble around the country for all of us to hide our innermost feelings. Well, don't worry, I'm not going to do that. I don't know how. <laughs> but if that were possible, and someday it may be, we have to face the possibility of what we're really keeping to ourselves. We need to clean up our thoughts and have a better discovery about who we are and where we come from. And they're going to try to help us with that just a little bit. Let's look at some drawings now as if we were in a schoolroom on a Pleiadian world and someone was drawing for us kind of a, a printout, so to speak, of what a universe is and how we come about in it. To begin with, what we call a universe, the Pleiadians call a creation. And they're telling us that in the beginning, it's nothing but a thought created by the creation just before it. You see, creations have to evolve also. 
They set up the logic for all life forms that follow it, including us. This creation then will grow and grow and reason and understand how to evolve on its own. It then becomes what's called the Sohar. The Sohar then is like what we think of as the Big Bang Theory. The Sohar then explodes into the size that the creation will be. No planets yet exist, only the energy that they will be made of. Creation will continue to manifest at different densities, creating planets, then the mineral kingdom, the food kingdom, animal kingdom, and us, in one large cycle of evolvement that finally brings it back together. It then continues on its evolvement by repeating this cycle. This cycle includes the growth of planets to raise it up to a certain level of evolution. Once the creation gets to that particular point, it has to figure out what to do next. The Pleiadians have been able to move back in time to the very origin of our creation and figure out step by step how it works. Most importantly, they've been able to discover how we fit into it. What is the meaning of life? They've been able to understand now that man goes through seven primary steps of development, beginning with very basic prehistoric life, moving totally up into creational's life. You see, that means we go through a series of material lives on purpose to learn, to spiritually grow and contribute energy to the evolvement of all creation. We are all part of the same spiritual force of creation, and we all participate in its evolution. The present creation that we live in is expanding. Soon it will be contracting again. The entire lifespan of this creation will be 311 trillion, 40 billion years. We're currently in the 47th trillion year. We're in the second of seven cycles of repeating this entire process. The planet Earth that we live on currently is 626 billion years old. Now this is measured a little differently than we do. The Pleiadians measure it from the formation of the gaseous ball. The average human is 80 to 100 million years old as a spirit form and is living in the second of seven cycles of primary growth of life. The Spirit's incarnation lessons focus on spreading knowledge, truth, wisdom, love, and understanding. All forms of life have to accomplish their own evolutionary process. Thus, they collect experiences and knowledge to share and utilize in their daily life. Much as the Pleiadians are sharing their information with us, they're also learning from other races. You see, the ship we're looking at is not designed and built by the Pleiadians. It's a present from another race called the Timmers, which live in what they call the Dal universe. The Pleiadians exchange some spiritual information for the design of this ship. You see, there are different levels of evolution all throughout creation. On this visit, the ship was piloted by a Pleiadian named Quetzal. Quetzal was the base commander here on Earth for the Pleiadians. Quetzal is seen here landing the beam ship at Billy's farm. The van you see is six feet wide and ten feet long, giving you some idea of the size of the new Pleiadian beam ship. Quetzal was able to stay till that evening where, in this picture, you can see Billy standing underneath the Pleiadian beam ship and the energy coming off of it. Now, one of the things we also deal with in our everyday life is prophecies. We've talked about time a little bit. If the Pleiadians can go into the past, can they also look into the future? They certainly can. How is this possible? How can we look into the future if it doesn't exist? Or does it already exist? The Pleiadians tell us that by virtue of the technology they have now that they've learned within their ships and also within their mind to be able to rise above a timeline, to step outside of time into what they call null time and kind of shuttle up and down a continuous energy track, re-enter that track wherever they want to and have a look at that particular time frame. You see, the past is fixed. We've already experienced it. It's already there. The future, however, though, is not fixed. It is ever-changing. It's based on the probability of free will. It works something like this. If we were able to borrow one of these Pleiadian beam ships and we were all able to hop into it and go for a ride, let's say we went 100 years into the future to have a look at our own city. Well, we get there and we look down and we see the future that we're creating for ourselves based on the thoughts we have right now. We then return to our own present time. We wait a couple of hours and then we return to that same spot in the future. Well, you know, things would be a little bit different because during that time while we were back in our own time, 
probability of free will went on. People made different choices. So the future changed just a little bit. The point simply is that the past is fixed, the future is ever changing. Now why do we need to know that? Well, we talk about prophecies, what are they? They're just flags, they're warnings. The Pleiadians have a way of sampling our energy, our collective energy as a planet, and based on that, their technology allows them to look ahead into the future and see the kind of future we're creating for ourselves with the thoughts that we have right now. The thing they want to point out to us is we don't have to settle for that. It's possible for us to change our own future. It's possible for us to have control with that. They also want us to know that that begins with self. It begins with realizing that we have 100% responsibility for ourself. Once we take control of our own future, then we can come together as a collective humanity. And then, doing things for the right reasons, we can move forward and create a new future for our planet. Billy Meyer has focused his entire life on what he's doing. He's very centered and balanced in his mission. Now, Billy and his family, of course, have suffered a lot of stress, a lot of abuse, but there's been some awfully good times because there's a very positive side to all of this. They also know that they're bringing to us, through the Pleiadians, a wonderful message of hope for the future. I want to leave you with one thought of my own. In the Pleiadian universal language that they speak, it's a tonal language that all space brothers speak, there's a word that means peace and wisdom. And on Pleiadian worlds, when they pass each other by or they say goodbye, whatever, they use this word to let each other know that they care about each other and that they bring peace and wisdom to all of those around them. So tonight, I'd like to say you and Pleiadian, Salome, and good night. When the spirit, this universal self, manifests itself in the human being through constant love, wisdom, and truth, then a major breakthrough occurs in the surrounding self veils, which eliminates the physical material urge of greed, anger, hate, avarice, and war. Then, and only then, has he reached the destination of his existence. <laughs>